I would try to describe what spiritual training is, I'd share with you uh, an incident in my early time with Baba that was uh, quite telling. I recall uh, a few months after getting back from India from being with Baba, uh, visiting my family in Boston. Uh, and we were sitting around the kitchen table and I thought, it's time to tell them you know, what I was doing in India and who I was fortunate enough to meet and uh, how you know, the blessing it was to meet Mayor Baba. And the Mayor Baba was the one whom all religions promised and who everyone awaits. So uh, my family being Jewish, I told that I had the great good fortune to meet the Messiah. And my father's response was, that's nice, but what does he do for a living? <laughs> so, so, so I, I told him that what he said was that uh, what he does for a living is he turns uh, liabilities into assets. <laughs> so, which is the essential definition of spiritual training. Uh, in uh, in Baba's trust that he gave out uh, in the late 50s, uh, defining very specifically what he wanted to be expressed through various forms of service, uh, one of them was spiritual training, the facilities for it, uh, and then certainly that he had come uh, for the Mandali in particular, and they were the examples par excellence of what Baba's spiritual training was like. Of course, uh, being directly uh, supervised by Baba, it was an adventure and exhaustion uh, and humiliation often, and uh, Baba gave special attention to working on the sanskaras of these remarkable people whom he called his mandali, his close inner circle, who many of us had the good fortune to spend time with uh, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, the, uh, the theme was basically to wear you out. And Baba did so with such success with Mandali that he referred to them as broken down furniture. Uh, they in turn, though not necessarily consciously, shared with those of us who had, were fortunate to spend time with them the uh, lessons that, that they had imbibed so well and that they in turn utilized with those of us who couldn't get enough of being with them, not enough, couldn't get enough of being in Baba's atmosphere. Uh, they, this, these took many forms. They weren't all conscious by any means. It was just the mindly being who they were, the remarkable, unique uh, individuals who so fully uh, were examples of what can happen when the avatar works on you all the way down and through who you, who you think you are. And they did it through humor. Uh, they did it through uh, all the different levels of work on us, uh, and from everything from uh, doing the work of building the structures of Maribad to uh, doing all the correspondence with them uh, to uh, cleaning and sweeping and whatever variety of things came up in the normal uh, course of living. Uh, one of the, uh, the stories that I recommend so well or that I'm reminded of was in, uh, in the early 80s there was a young Westerner from uh, Northern California came to India for his first visit. 
And he had heard that Mani, um, a sister, was going to be a perfect master in her next life, and she would be a man. And he was very enamored by Mani, who was so remarkable and wonderful a person, effervescent and wise, and a joy to be around. And he had this, he had become what some refer to if they weren't going to be Baba lovers, they were Mani lovers. <laughs> so it was the custom of the Mandali to go to the trust office uh, three days a week from Merzad to do the work that was needed. That's when Mani was chairman. And at the end of the work day, which was after tea time, the Mandali would then get back in the car and drive back to Merzad. Zerich, and Rano, and Mani. And those of us who were fortunate enough to be there at the time they were leaving, uh, would, one could line up and get hugs from them as they made their way to the car. Well, this young man decided to take the bull by the horns when it was his turn to see Mani. And he said, Mani, I've heard that Baba said that you have one more life and you're going to be a man and that you'd be a perfect master. And Mani said that Baba never said she would be a perfect master. But however, the part about one more life and as a man was, was accurate. And the young man asked Mani, when you come back, can I be with you? And Mani looked at him very sweetly and said, ask me then. <laughs> That's the perfect response. <laughs> She's, uh, when he asked her if he could come, when she came again, if he could be with her, she said, ask me then. Uh, there were a lot of ways in which the Mandali exemplified his teachings and the various forms that were taken to uh, try to mold us Westerners into a more reasonable simile of someone who is a worker, never mind a lover. One of another story from the early days is when the first Westerners went to live there as residents in the early 70s, the rules that today govern Meribah weren't in force at that time. They weren't even articulated. Uh, and so a couple of young Western men would go into town every day to the trust office to do trust work with Adi and then come back in the evening to Meribah. And it was their habit to have dinner in town and maybe have some beer. Uh, well, one evening, uh, one of them stayed later and uh, had more than one beer, and suddenly realized what time it was and scooted back to, to Mehrabad in a rickshaw. And it was dark by then, uh, and the last thing this person wanted to do was to let Padre know that he was coming late and somewhat inebriated. So when the, the rickshaw reached the, the, uh, the road uh, going to Meribah, he had the rickshaw walla shut off the engine so he could coast in. <laughs> and then he started to sort of tiptoe towards his room. And suddenly he hears Padre saying, who goes there? <laughs> and very differently the Westerner said, nobody. <laughs> Padre said, you're not nobody yet, mister. <laughs> uh, it says spiritual training takes different forms. <laughs> but what spiritual training is based on, and what I'd like to uh, have right now, really what, what the whole idea is living the new life. I mean, that's what spiritual training is, that's what the goal is. 
It's what we're here to do. It's what Baba very clearly and ex expressively uh, conveyed to uh, all for now and forevermore that the goal is to live the new life. And Fred is going to read this out slowly and carefully. And it's just, it's just right here. New life message. This new life is endless, and even after my physical death, it will be kept alive by those who live the life of complete renunciation of falsehood, lies, hatred, anger, greed, and lust, and who, to accomplish all this, do no lustful actions, do no harm to anyone, do no backbiting, do not seek material possessions or power, who accept no homage, neither covet honor nor shun disgrace, and fear no one and nothing, by those who rely wholly and solely on God, and who love God purely for the sake of loving, who believe in the lovers of God and in the reality of manifestation, and yet do not expect any spiritual or material reward, who do not let go the hand of truth, and who, without being upset by calamities, bravely and wholeheartedly face all hardships with 100% cheerfulness, and give no importance to caste, creed, and religious ceremonies, this new life will live by itself eternally, even if there is no one to live it. You want him to use this? He has no problem. So, you know, that's a remarkable challenge. And certainly it can't be accomplished by any of us individually other than with a considerable amount of grace. But if we want to know what spiritual training is, that's what it is. Um, and, you know, Baba confirmed how essential it is in our path towards become like, becoming lovers of God. When I lived in, uh, in India with the Mandali from 1979 to 83, my work initially was to go through the Meher Baba journals, which had no tables of contents, and to read the articles and then write tables of contents for each of the journals. I'm probably one of the only people in the world who's read them all. Uh, but my, my, quote, desk was the uh, table and benches where the men Mandali would have their meals, just opposite Mandali Hall. Uh, so it's just basically a picnic bench. That would be my, quote, office. I'd get there in the morning and spread out all the papers and journals and whatnot and sit there and scribble away until it was time for the men to have lunch. And I'd gather everything up and put it away till later. Over time, it became my custom that when I heard the bells that Mara had come out on the porch, I would take a Mara break uh, and go and spend some time listening to her before I'd come back to do whatever the work I was involved in. <clears throat> As it turned out, one day I became so enthralled by a story that Mara was telling, I lost all track of time. I didn't hear the bell uh, for the men's lunch and came back, suddenly remembered that I was supposed to clear the table so they could have their meal, and ran back uh, to deal with it to find that it was too late, that somebody else had cleared everything away, and the men were having their meal. And I just felt terrible. Uh, and I was working uh, with Balna too on this project, and I told Bal how sorry I was that I hadn't come back in time and that I got involved in the story the mayor was telling. Uh, and I felt quite contrite. And Bob looked at me and smiled and I said, remember one thing, Robert. He said, your real work is sitting with Mayra. This is only your so-called work. <laughs> so, <coughs> priorities. Um, one of the ways in which the 
lessons were conveyed was via the medium of anger. So, you know, a stubborn uh, facet of our character that most of us uh, struggle with over the course of our lives at different times. Uh, this involved a time when I was sitting with Adi Kehrani in his office, <coughs> having a talk, and suddenly the door slammed open and Padre came in shouting at, uh, at Adi. And Adi looked at, got up and looked at Padre. These are two strong, vibrant, remarkable individuals. And they were both standing there shouting at each other. And I was sitting and trying to become invisible <laughs> in the corner of the room uh, while they you know, railed back and forth with each other uh, in, in, uh, in Gujarati. <clears throat> and then Paji turned around and stormed out and slammed the, slammed the door. And I was sitting there basically quivering. And Adi looked at me and said, did that bother you? <laughs> <laughs> I said, yes, Adi, it didn't bother me. He said, did it bother us? <laughs> so he said, Baba trained us from the earliest days to deal with whatever was going on for us in terms of anger, to express it, say it out loud, and forget it. Let go of it. He said, neither Padre nor I are carrying any charge from it. That was... That was quite some lesson, uh, simply because of who they were and those people were, how they dealt with an issue that was important. It had to do with plumbing supplies for a well or something. Uh, yeah, that, that was certainly one way in which uh, you know, a lesson got conveyed at a very deep level. Uh, There was, uh, I'm reminded of another, another way, which was with, with Erich. In 1979, I went to the, the first Amartiti I attended. And I had traveled all day and all night from San Francisco to India to arrive the first morning of Amartiti without sleep. And of course, for those of you who know Amartiti is an absolutely extraordinary occasion in which what I feel is Baba's majesty is displayed. And thousands and thousands of people come from all over the world, busloads of them from across India to go up and pay their respects to to Baba on the anniversary of his path, dropping his body. Uh, the lines would go from the Samadhi all the way down the hill past the railroad tracks. It would take an average of four to five hours from the time one got in line till the time one got into the Samadhi to bow down and then only to be ushered out immediately. Uh, It was Erich's custom in those days to stay up for the entire length of Amartiti and tell stories. He would sit on the ledge outside Baba's cabin <clears throat> all night long without sleep, telling stories. <clears throat> and I decided that I'd set up stay, to, to stay up with him. It was a great opportunity. Uh, spend more time with him. Uh, it was somewhat of an attitude of, well, if he can do it, I can do it. He was 25 years older than I am. <laughs> and so for the next three nights, I stayed up with, with Erich. And on the fourth night, without sleep, I looked at him and I said, Erich, I said, what kind of vacation am I having? <laughs> So I didn't sleep getting here. I traveled all day and all night across the world to be here. 
I haven't slept for the last three nights with staying up with you during all the week. So what kind of vacation is this? And Arish looked at me and said, Robert, it's a vacation from sleep. <laughs> 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 I don't recommend it, by the way. <laughs> so, uh, it was the, it helped reveal the treasure that complete exhaustion is required for to bring to consciousness. And of course, in that charged atmosphere, it was all the more telling. Uh, You know, Padre would, uh, he got a real kick out of the Westerners. He would, sitting on the veranda at Lower Maribot, watching people went up the hill and down and said, ah, look at those loonies. And he called all the Westerners loonies. And he said, the reason why he called us loonies was, he said, these people are mad, I tell you. He said, they could be lying on a beach in some beautiful island somewhere, having a real vacation. And they come here to this place. See, they're mad people. They're loonies. And the old ones, they call them Maha Loonies. <laughs> yeah. But he got, he got a great kick out of that. Um, I'm reminded of a story that helps amplify that. Uh, After I'd been living in India for a few months, in 79, it was my custom to go to Maribad every Thursday evening after the day in Marizad uh, and spend Friday at, at, at Maribad. Friday Marizad was closed. Uh, and after I'd been doing this for a few months, riding my motorcycle back and forth, one day Heather asked her, why don't you just stay here overnight? Save the trip. I hadn't even thought of it. <coughs> so she said, you know, just ask Mani next time you see her. So I made an appointment to ask Mani at the trust office if it was, if could get her approval to stay overnight to uh, Maribah. And Mani looked at me and said, that, that'd be fine, but be sure and ask Padre. So when I was the next at Maribah, I was sitting with Padre outside. And uh, I explained to him, I said, Padre, you know, I've been coming every week and leaving for the night and then coming back again the following day. And one day Heather said, why don't you simply stay overnight and uh, ask Mani. I said, so I asked Mani, and Mani said it was fine. And Padre said, I don't care what she says. He said, I'm the boss here. If I want you to stay, you'll stay. And if not, I'll kick you out. I'll drive you out. And I looked at him and I said, and I laughed. I said, that's because you're a driver. <laughs> and he cracked up and said, ah, good one, Dreyfus, you stay. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Padre's real name was Faradun Driver. So it was these little lovely moments like that uh, <coughs> that were so telling. The, uh, you know, all of us familiar with the wonderful character Ali Akbar Shakur Zaman, mm. otherwise known as Alaba, uh, who had a great love of uh, portents and uh, imminent disasters, uh, which to him were a sign that the advent was about to occur. He was, but he did it through a form of simple humor uh, in many cases. Uh, his famous uh, <clears throat> abilities to making the best chai in the world at three o'clock every uh, every visitor's day, when he would, it didn't matter, he didn't care who was talking in the hall, Erich, 
mirror was on the porch, whatever. He got the cowbell out and started ringing it, saying, take tea at three and be free. <laughs> Rush out for tea. And uh, you know, when the buses were leaving, he'd say, you know, leave your longings, take your belongings. Uh, <coughs> but he was an example of a, someone totally dedicated and devoted to, to Baba, uh, Baba used in unique ways. He, uh, I, you know, I think again of, of Padre and uh, you know, Padre would say, you know, every time they try to send someone to find water, and Maribad, you know, Padre would go along with it. The dowsers would come. You know, Look for wells, sources of wells. There's always a chronic shortage of water. And Padre's response would be, you're welcome to look, mister. But here you won't find water, but you will find God. <laughs> uh, and The day before Padre died, Gary Kleiner, a resident uh, in India, was doing a video interview of Padre and asking Padre questions which were then being filmed, his responses. And Kleiner had a unique perspective on the spiritual path asked Padre, uh, he said to the effect of, well, now that Bob is no longer here, you know, what is, how does this affect you know, <clears throat> his emphasis on obedience? And Padre looked at Kleiner and he said, not here. Where do you think he is, you damn fool? <laughs> says, not here. He, only he is. He is here. And really built against <laughs> Kleiner's uh, uh, questioning. And at that point, <clears throat> a village woman from Aragon came to ask Padre something. This is all being filmed. And Padre was furious with her for, can't you see I'm busy woman? You know, this is, this is being interviewed, what the hell do you want? This is all going on in Marathi. Uh, and starts swearing at her, which he was uh, want to do in Marathi, and then goes back to the interview. Well, the next day, Padre died. <clears throat> so two or three weeks later, there was a request to show the film by Mani uh, in Mandali Hall for the uh, Sunday entertainment. Uh, in which Mara, all the women, and, and, and many of the men, and all the pilgrims were all sitting in the hall, and this interview with Padre was taking place. And suddenly this whole episode with the woman, the villager, comes up, and you can hear those of us who knew a little bit of the language, certainly the swear words, uh, you hear Padre castigating this woman with calling her all sorts of names in the Marathi. And Mera and the ladies there are just, <laughs> just giggling and you know, laughing among themselves during this part. And then uh, it was over that Western pilgrims wanted to know what Padre had said to her. And Mera said, no, no, there's some things we don't translate. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, it was, it was uh, thoroughly delightful and a wonderful send-off uh, from for Padre in many ways. He once uh, stated that he, when he died, he wanted to go quickly, like uh, he put it like a rocket. Yeah. <laughs> and he did. He was sitting, dictating a letter to Pop Street about some homeopathic supplies that uh, needed to be sent from Germany. Uh, Padre was sitting there 
on the veranda dictating this letter and Bob was just writing it down. And uh, Paji's last words for the letter were sincerely yours. And then uh, Bob's you know, catching up with writing and and so he says, anything else you want to add, Padre? Padre, his head was down, his face was ready, he died. Wow. Just like that. Wow. <clears throat> and Mari said he went like lightning. She said that uh, she had never seen a body so empty of its inhabitants. Mm -hmm. uh, what a way to go, huh? There was another, two years earlier, Audrey had had a heart attack and used to be a smoker. <clears throat> he stopped smoking when he had this heart attack, but they, they were convinced that he was dying. And uh, they quickly notified everybody that uh, Audrey might be on his way out and everybody rushed in and he's lying there on, on, the, on the cot. And Heather starts singing, you know, Baba's name. And Padre, Padre looks up and he says, Will you stop that yammering woman? I'm not dead yet. <laughs> you know, he had a slightly acerbic nature. Was, some people found difficult, and others uh, enjoyed. I enjoyed it mostly. Well, it wasn't directed at me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he was, uh, <clears throat> he, had a, he had a wonderful sense of humor. Um, Adi K. Arani, Baba's secretary for so many years, was in the habit at one point uh, in the late 70s, we'd go up to you and say, who are you, what are you, why are you? <laughs> Which most people were fully nonplussed. And how do you respond to that? Especially with Adi. One day I ran into him. He was coming down Mirabai Hill and I was going up. And he looked at me. <laughs> he said, sir, who are you, what are you, why are you? And I said, Adi, I said, why not? He said, good answer. I mentioned that even in death, the lessons came, perhaps the strongest ones. Steve will remember, he and uh, Jack Small and myself accompanied Adi to Andhra Pradesh, South India, in early March of 1980, Adi had been invited to go to a uh, city in Andhra, Guntur, for the opening of a new Baba Center. <coughs> and he allowed us to accompany him on the long train ride down to uh, into South India. And Adi had a great time. He loved it. He, at one point during that trip, he said, I pray to Baba I live at least 10 more years. He said, I have so much I have, want to do and so much I have to do. And he loved going to new centers and opening up the uh, installations. He already had plans to go to Jabalpur. He was talking about our going here, there, and everywhere. He had a book to, to write. And, um, full of life. It was wonderful. And as Steve will remember uh, indelibly, uh, that second night we were in Guntur after giving the talk and we went out for a, a big Chinese meal and uh, watermelon for dessert. Adi died in, in Andhra and suddenly he had a heart attack in the middle of the night. And there were was, was the three of us with Adi's body. They, one of the local people got a doctor to come and do the death certificate. I was given the task of calling the trust office and telling Bao that 
out he was gone. Yeah, I remember I placed what they called the lightning call in those days. It only took three hours. <laughs> and I said, oh, gee, I said, Adi has died. And one of the details, he said, bring him, small myself, and Adi's body. Wrapped in ice and in bandages, in sheets. And we, there was only two seats in the front. So there was the driver in the underwall, and there was the three of us in Adi's body in the back seat. And we drove straight through, other than to get gas and pedal, for a thousand miles across Indian roads without his body. Uh, it's actually took about 24 hours. We were you know, beyond exhaustion. And of course, the shock of, you know, of Adi's death. Uh, and we drove day and night to get back to Maribad. And when we pulled in, there were hundreds and hundreds of people there. They sent out cables, they telephone calls to Bombay, to Pune. I mean, thousands of people knew Adi from his work as Baba's secretary for so many years. All the Mandali were there in Maribad waiting for us. Uh, <coughs> And we finally, you know, we finally arrived. I remember the boss, she was there and squirted rescue remedy into all our mouths. Um, they took uh, Adi's body out of the car. We struggled out of the car uh, as well. And Padji had already had a pine box made. Um, and they put Adi's body in the in this simple coffin. And some of the old timers Everyone came by to pay their respects, of course. But I remember particularly how it affected you know, Padre was on one end, Pendu, Erich. You know, they've, they've known him their whole lives. And Adi, Pendu, was saying, Baba made a mistake. Baba made a mistake. I said, Pendu, what, what kind of mistake did he make? He said, by one letter. He said, you see, Adi was Adi Kevani. Pendu's real name was Espandia R. Adi. He said, for that one letter, it should have been R, not, not K. It, it should have been him that went. Padre wanted to live so much, and Pendu couldn't wait to get it over with. And of course, Pendu waited on for years to come, and Padre just, quick exit. Um, so that was, you know, that was uh, another lesson of spiritual training. Holding on and letting go at the same time. It reminds me of a, of a sweet story about Pendu. Pendu uh, had been in the auto accident with Baba in Satara and had, his legs were seriously injured. He was in pain for the rest of his life. And initially the pain was uh, so extreme that it, it was on the edge of tears. And one time someone asked Baba, why did Pendu have to suffer so much? And Baba's response was, because he could take it. But I, would, I got in the habit of every day when the women went over for tea with Mera, I would sit with Pendu, it was a men's tea. And uh, other people would come and join us and there'd be stories. And I noticed that over the months that people came and they would try to help Pendu with his pain in his legs. And Reiki, and massage, and chiropractic, and soaks, and herbs, and whatnot. And one day I said, Pendu, I said, has anyone given you acupuncture? He said, no, dear. But no one has come and does it. That, that, that Sunday, a Chinese woman arrived and doing his, uh, a course in Shanghai and came and gave him acupuncture treatment. 
I asked him, I said, does any of this help you? And he looked at me and said, no, dear, but it helps them. <laughs> <laughs> and during that time, in 1980, Casey Cook, whom many of you know, who's been a resident of me for the last 25 years, uh, her father and sister came for a visit. Her father's a physician and her sister's a nurse. And they were curious about acupuncture and wanted to know uh, what it was like. So yes, Penda was going to have a treatment and in a very small room adjacent to the what is now the old dispensary uh, was where the treatment would be. So Casey asked Penda if she mind if he minded if her father and sister were observed the treatment. And Pendu said, no, that's fine. So Pendu and myself and the Chinese acupuncturist and Casey and her father and mother all crowded into this small room. Pendu lay down, they're all standing watching, and he's about to have the acupuncture treatment. He calls me over. And I said, yes, Kaka. He said, he whispers in my ear, too many cooks. <laughs> Another example of humor, mm -hmm. perspective. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to share stories that create a deeper effect and have a a deeper meaning through through laughter. And Baba, of course, has such a wonderful sense of humor. And uh, as he said he was the avatar with, with, with humor. So uh, he, cre he created many conditions uh, for spiritual truths to be expressed, one of the best ways of which was through laughter. Uh, The, uh, you know, I know that many of you have met Aravaz, who is now 90, and has been ill for some time and yet continues to, to pull on, uh, much to the surprise of the people dedicated to caring for her. Arnavaz is a, a woman of considerable charm and deep wisdom uh, and has served as a lay therapist for countless pilgrims uh, in various relationship problems. Uh, she, she had this wonderful way of bringing the focus back to Baba at every opportunity. And uh, when I saw her last, which was this past October, she reminded me again and again uh, that, in reference to children, that she said, always remember, she said, your children are not your own. They're here for Baba's work. He's brought them here. They're his. And it's so important to have that go down to the bones, as it were, that uh, you know, there's a far greater work going on than, than we're necessarily aware or conscious of. I think I'm running out of time, but just tell about your first meeting with Baba. Oh, that, that's, that's a whole afternoon. Oh. <laughs> Next time. That's all. I'd be happy to. Uh, but actually, Fred, there's one more, one more little reading here, if you don't mind. <coughs> this is a statement that Mayor Baba gave out at the East West Gallery in 1962.
Now you are older and are beginning to realize that there is greater work ahead of you than what you have been doing and you have been searching your minds and hearts as to what this work might be. It is not different work from what you have already been doing. It is the same work done in a different way. And that way is the way of effacement, which means the more you work for me, the less important you feel in yourself. My work is your opportunity. The way of my work is the way of effacement, which is the way of strength, not of weakness. And through it, you become mature in my love. Meher Baba, East West Gathering, 1962. Jeva. Jeva. Thank you all so much for inviting me to be here at this wonderful occasion in this beautiful center. It's such a pleasure to see so many of you again after too long a time. And hopefully we'll all continue to grow all together in this love. We're already started. <laughs> Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you.